Good afternoon, members of parliament, support staff, personnel from Justice Ministry in the Public Tribune, radio listeners, TV viewers, those following via social media, and members of media. Welcome to this urgent public meeting number 17, question hour of today, Thursday, April 6, 2023. I would like to give a special welcome to the Honorable Minister of Justice, Ms. Anna Richardson, and her support staff. We have established a quorum of eight members. Please stand for a moment of silence. Thank you. <clears throat> I have received notice of absence from the following members, MP Solange Duncan, MP Sarah Westcott-Williams, MP Peterson, MP Gums. Does any member have any notifications? No need. Thank you. We have as agenda point for this public meeting. Question over. Questions from MP Grisha Heiliger Martin directed to the Minister of Justice regarding the placement procedure and the ongoing issues between the police union and the Ministry of Justice under the document IS 680 slash 2022 23, dated April 5th, 2023. We go to the agenda point. The intention of the question over is to create the possibility to interact with ministers after the passing of Hurricane Irma. Article 69 of the Rules of Order was proposed in order to introduce the question hour. During the question hour, only questions and answers will be given on the topic at hand. As we have had many question hours, I will shortly elucidate on the procedure for the question hour. The Member of Parliament will get the opportunity to read his or her questions as submitted for a maximum of two minutes according to the Article 69D, Paragraph 3 of the Rules of Order. The Minister is given the opportunity to answer the questions for a maximum of one minute per question according to the Article 69D, Paragraph 3 of the Rules of Order. The Member of Parliament is then given the opportunity once more to ask additional questions for a maximum of two minutes under Article 69D, Paragraph 4 of the Rules of Order. The Minister is given one minute to answer each question under Article 69D, Paragraph 4 of the Rules of Order. The President then may allow the other members of Parliament to ask questions for a maximum of one minute about the same topic according to the Article 69D, Paragraph 5 of the Rules of Order. The Minister is given one minute to answer each question according to Article 69D, Paragraph 5 of the Rules of Order. During the question hour, no permission can be asked to hold an interpolation, interruption, nor can motions be submitted. Today, Thursday, April 6, 2023, we have questions that were submitted by MP Grisha Heiliger Martin under document IS 680 slash 2022-23 dated April 5, 2023, for the Minister of Justice. These questions were submitted in accordance with the Article 69 of the Rules of Order. The Minister of Justice, Ms. Anna Richardson, was invited by letter under UV-138-2022-23. Hence, in accordance with the Article 69D, Paragraph 3, Member of Parliament, Grisha Halligar Martin, will read her questions to the minister. I would like to propose to the floor that the member receives one extra minute considering the number of questions sent in and the pressing matter at hand. Members are reminded that for question hour, questions should be able to be read within two minutes. MP Grisha Halliger Martin, you have the floor. Good afternoon to you, Mr. Chairman. I'll get straight into the answer to the question, seeing that I only have three minutes, and thank you for the extra minute. Minister, when putting the placement procedure in place, were unions, and farms or, were unions informed or involved in the planning and the procedures that were to be executed? If yes, please give dates and who were present in those meetings and the topics discussed. 
all unions rep are all unions represent represented under the CCSU. Can you explain the procedure of putting an offer letter together, and is there a legal document that guides this process? Can you tell us who is the placement committee, who is on the placement committee, and the appeal committee? Are the unions represented on these committees, and is the formation of these committees done according to the law? Who is legally allowed to sign the offer letter, and what legal document is this based on? Are all workers on the Justice Ministry receiving an offer letter? Are the workers free to appeal, reject the offer given to them? When a worker receives his offer letter and the offer is not accepted, can you please give an explanation on the procedure that must be followed? If the offer is accepted, what is the procedure and how soon thereafter can a worker expect to be paid? The date of March 31st, 2023, the end of the first quarter is being mentioned as a deadline. Can you please explain if there was a deadline and what exactly was, the con was, would, was to be concluded by this date? If you, were able, if you were unable to meet this deadline, can you please explain why? Will the 16.3% Windward Island Allowance Bovenwinsa Tulacha be included in the payment that will be made? And final question, are there any plans to adjust the salary scales of the workers in scales six to nine? There are many workers that can find themselves in a very detrimental situation. These scales have not been amended while the pension age has increased to 65. And if I have more time, I want to expound by saying that the offer letter presented to them does not allow them to grow or the possibility to earn more money as they have reached the maximum in scale that is assigned to their position. Some has, re some has reached and remained on this level for the past 10 years. And we are seeing, and what we are seeing is that many are disappointed since the remuneration that was expected and is nowhere close and they don't have the possibility of growth. With that, I'd like to leave it here. Did I make it on time? Yes? 2.37. Thank you, M MP Grisha Harlegar Martin. I would now give the floor to the Minister of Justice, Ms. Anna Richardson, to answer the questions. Minister, you have the floor. A uh, pleasant good afternoon to you, Mr. Chairman, as well as to all the members that are here today, members of parliament, and a good afternoon to all the officers that are here in the tribune. Um, the first question that is asked by, and I should actually extend an appreciation as well to MP Heiliger for um, presenting these questions. I believe that the way that these questions are structured, it really does give an opportunity to bring clarity to what may be um, uh, misunderstood or not clear for the persons that this affects mostly. Um, question one, Minister, when putting the placement procedure in place, in a question hour, I mean, I'm able to respond to the question, just answer. answer, just answer, sorry, okay, so for question one, it is basically being asked, um, who was all involved in these meetings and when these meetings took place. The dates that I have that are relevant in particular to this placement process is December 2nd was the first meeting that we had with regards to identifying who would be a part of the placement committee as well as the what, appeals committee, okay? Um, for the Landspeslite, which I have a, a copy here, the national decree. In the national decree, it stipulates exactly who are the members of these. Uh, it was recently brought to my attention that this has not yet been published as, as per, I believe, April 14th. It will be published in the National Gazette um, or the Landskurant for all persons to be able to have a copy of. And this is what governs the legal basis of establishing or the, how you say, role and responsibility of the placement committee as well as the Bazwar Committee. Um, in attendance to those meetings was the NRPB, um, ABVO, WICSU, Y2, am I missing anyone? No? So all the unions were present, especially in that meeting on December 2nd, when it was decided who would be a part of these committees. So absolutely no union was excluded. Are all unions represented in the CCSU? 
the only union by uh, legal framework that is not, and that is due to their size, is the NRPB. However, I requested Mr. Bosman, who is the chairman of the CCSU, to give opportunity for NRPB to be present, and the Y2, that is uh, in the leadership of Mr. Stuart Johnson, will always give the opportunity to vote and speak to NRPB to be able to ensure that their position, their voice is heard. Can you explain the procedure of putting an offer letter together? The offer letter, and again, I refer back to the Landsbysleid and what it stipulates is the role and responsibility of each committee. The role and responsibility of the placement committee is to work together with the agency or the department because this is about operations. The agency is the one who is aware of the responsibility of each officer. In this case, let's use CAPSM. The chief of police knows who has to be where, what service line, and what has to be done. Together, the chief of police and his HR team worked with the placement committee to ensure that the placement of the, each officer is done in accordance to what their operational structure requires. So that is not something that is determined, decided, or um, orchestrated by the minister. This is done on an operations level. The placement committee will then draft up the necessary text, and they are the ones that issues this letter. It is also signed by the placement committee because of the legal basis of the national decree. So it is not the Minister of Justice that signs the national decree, and I believe that is the next question or a question that comes. Um, the placement uh, uh, letter or the offer letter is not signed by the minister nor the governor. When the offer is accepted, then the national decree is prepared, and that document is signed by the minister and the governor. Can you tell who is the placement committee? I can read off these names, but again, as per April 14th, it will be printable and available online. Uh, Mr. Dahl, as a consultant, is chairing the placement committee. Ms. Florence Marlin, as our HR manager and acting SG, is also a part of this committee. And a member, actually the vice president of NRP Bay, Mr. Duran, or Officer Duran, is the third member of the placement committee. So he is also well aware of our status and all that is taking place in this procedure. The appeals committee, um, Ms. Van Harperen, she is a senior legal policy advisor in judicial affairs of the ministry. We have Ms. Ismail, she is the head of judicial affairs of the Ministry of Justice. Ms. S. Kanagita, she is the president of WICSU. Ms. Charlene Catalina, he is the president of AVO. And Ms. Anne Groen Gums, she is also a member of the Appeals Committee. Are all unions represented on these committees, and is the, information, is the formation of these committees done according to law? The members uh, or the unions that have members that are a part of these committees, as I indicated, are NRP Bay, ABVO, and WICSU. And yes, it is in accordance to the law, that being the Social Statute, um, and by extension, by national decree of the Placement Committee and the Appeals Committee. Who is legally uh, allowed to sign the offer letter and what law is this based on? So once again, I make mention that we establish the authority of the Placement Committee and the Appeals Committee to execute these functions that are all governed within the Social Statute by that of a Landsbysleid. So the Minister of Justice has given the mandate to these entities or these committees to be able to oversee this entire process. Are all workers of the Justice Ministry receiving offer letters? That ultimately is that. Um, all agencies to date, with the exception of immigration and Harvey Bay or the prison, have received their letters. Immigration is a very large organization, just like RPSM. We saw to it, or the committee, or um, the group, it is only about four persons that are doing all of this by hand, preparing the letters, getting them signed, preparing the envelopes, putting the letters in the envelopes, having the letters delivered to the agencies, and then the department heads are the ones to distribute. Um, but one thing that I have to make through you, Mr. Chairman, very, um, very clear, and I, I believe I said this before, 
it is a very serious process because the moment an error is made where an offer is given that is outside of the reality of that individual, that individual can take legal action because the wrong information was given to them. They also have the ability to do an objection, which is different than an appeal, okay? But it is a case that when the, when the large Excel file is sent to the, the agency to prepare and make sure that the information is accurate, we aren't just making letters based on that and issuing. Our HR department, who are ladies that have vast experience in HR, sits and they comb through every single line to make sure that the information is as accurate as possible. Then the letter is printed and it is then issued to the staff. So we totally understand the, um, the upset for the lack of a better expression of our immigration department because they feel like the focus has only been placed on per se uh, CAP ASM and nothing is happening for them. That is not the truth. We are really working in the background as much as possible. As a matter of fact, I will tell you here, I have sat and made labels and stuck labels onto envelopes to be able to give the other persons who are working on making sure the information is correct the time and ability to do that. So all of us have all hands on deck and we are working in the interest of the staff. Are the workers free to appeal or reject the offer given to them? Yes, the workers are free to reject an offer and file an objection with the appeals committee. But one of the things that we are trying to do as well is, even before allowing it to go to an appeals committee, if you want to come in and say, listen, because I will want to bring back um, the date of February 14th, which was another meeting that we had with the CCSU. And in attendance to that, ABVO and and our pay bay was not in attendance to this meeting. In that meeting, it was requested by the CCSU if we will be permitted to receive something as simple as an email from an officer or a person within the, the, the organization, within the ministry, who would say, listen, I don't have a national decree or even a ministerial decree to confirm that I functioned in a particular position for X amount of period of time. But what I do have is an email. And this email that came from my supervisor or my director gave me direction to work somewhere for a period of time and I believe I should be compensated for that. That wasn't a decision just made by the minister on her own to do that. I sought approval from CCSU, which is the proper thing to do. In that meeting, it was granted that we could use an email to support staff. Guess what happened? When that was published, there was a lot of negative feedback. You don't have your administration. That is true. The entire ministry in itself does not have, or did not, I should say, have its administration properly in order. But we wanted to make sure that all staff are heard and their scenarios are considered. When they got placement letters, we did have some staff that came in and said, listen, my offer letter isn't correct because I have proof to show. And this is exactly why we went to the CCSU to seek approval. Now, had I not taken that step, I would have to say, well, I don't have approval. I'll have to go to CCSU and that would have. But we thought beforehand, go and seek this approval, which we acquired on the February 14th. Again, I am stating NRP Bay and ABVO was not present in those meetings, so the other members of the CCSU platform understood our request and approved it. When workers receive his offer letter and the offer is not accepted, can you please give an explanation on the procedure? I sure can. Um, and I would want to make reference to two very important items that has been published. Four minutes, so you have to read the answer. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I think that Mr. Chairman, to be very honest with you, this is a very delicate situation. That's why I thank the MP for even giving us the opportunity because my hope is that we would be able to bring the clarity. This, it's really intense, so I don't know if the time allotted will be sufficient. Just ask him. Um, but with regards to the question, which wants to know about the, the procedure if you want to make an uh, objection, uh, two do documents were given, one on the offer letter itself as well as the newsletter that we issued on the 24th of March. 
gives extensive information about the entire procedure. And one of the things it has here is, do you want to check this? Uh, well, it says, if the information is incorrect, please let us know within 30 days via our HR at justice.gov.sx. Please note that this is stipulated in the Social Statute for the Construction of Land of St. Martin. Okay, so we have expressed on various levels how one can go about expressing that they don't agree with what has been offered. If the offer is accepted, what is the procedure and how soon thereafter can our worker expect to be paid? We are aiming to complete, we were aiming to complete the calculations, and this goes into another question, the calculations in itself for all 700 plus employees we have and be able to turn that over to the governor as per the 31st of March, okay? Indeed, a deadline missed. Um, and in explain, explaining why the deadline was missed is because this process includes gathering historic information so that each person receives their rightful amount due. You cannot do that if you don't have accurate information. So it relies on the staff going into the history, which is supported by Antec, who provides the system for our payroll. Um, it, it requires us working with loan in Salaris, and it requires us being able to even get bank statements to confirm what payments had been issued uh, prior to, to any further payments. Uh, and that is what I'm saying here. It goes into question 11 about the deadline of the 31st, which was to complete the entire calculation process, send that to the governor. That is what was stipulated um, several times for us to have complete. If you were unable to meet this deadline, can you please explain why? And I did just now by indicating that in this process of acquiring historic data, we have encountered certain hiccups that made it difficult for us to meet the deadline. And I am truly, along with my staff that is working, sorry that we did not meet that, but it hasn't stopped us. We are still um, running strong to be able to get it complete. Will the 16.3 Windward Islands allowance be included in the payment um, that will be made. Yes, the salary base has been altered to incorporate the 16.3 allowance. Once again, this was done in 2010, but after two months, the unions, after two months, it was the Minister. decision of the unions to have it removed. And that is uh, what we are I would, busy I would like to, to request members of parliament, uh, ministers, time is up, but being the matter at hand, I would request if five more minutes can be given to her, if it's allowed. It's Minister, not necessary, you have five actually. Extra no, it's, it's, not, it's really not no, necessary. So you, I saw that you were trying Rushing to speed through. up, yeah, and I, I would like all the clarification to be out better. So you have five more minutes extra for your answer. Okay, so then what I would do is this, because technically, uh, when it comes to question 14, with regards to, which is actually the last question of MP um, uh, Heiliger. It is asking for justification about um, the scales between six and nine. And, and to be honest with you, um, MP, I would appreciate an opportunity to delve into this one a little bit more. And why I say that is because we have to keep in mind that one, that draft uh, salary scale was one that was established in 2019. It had gone to the Council of Advice. This is something that the unions had also worked on. So the unions are the ones that basically uh, shaped the way that our salary scales are structured. And if it's one thing that I didn't do is go against unions very much about the expositi and the salary scales. I really did not. Um, I tried my best to be able to work with them very much on it. Uh, and I think that you know, question 12 is the only one in terms of meeting the deadline. I've given the, the overview on it. So pretty much I, I, I think I've covered everything, but I'm, I'm, I'm available for any additional information that is necessary because I, I, I said before, Pretty, pretty grateful for the questions and the opportunity to be able to bring the clarity. Thank you, Minister Richardson. MP Heiliger Martin now has the opportunity once more to ask additional questions for a maximum of two minutes under Article 69D, Paragraph 4 of the Rules of Order. MP Heiliger Martin, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, quickly, uh, the placement letters that were received, two things about it. I received some complaints that some of the police officers received 
received them as if they were, through you, Mr. Chairman, as if they were copy-paste, that they were overlooked, and some of them were just copy-paste and repetitive, and some some looked the same with um, with with um, with what was received. So it was like a copy-paste thing. It doesn't reflect them personally. So they, re I, I, maybe you could explain me that. I don't know if you received any complaints on that. Also, some in the letters, they are citing articles with um, from the Rexpositi, and as we all know, the Rexpositi has not been ratified. Is that a problem? Is that normal? Is that okay to do to re to, to to cite articles from a, a, a from the Rexpositi that hasn't been ratified as yet? And uh, also, Minister, through you, Mr. Chairman, also mentioned that she hasn't met the met the, the deadline of March 31st. I don't know how many of the 700 the minister has done. How many more time do you need to finalize that calculation? Do you need another month, another two months? Maybe the time span was too short for 700 and something. How much has the minister done thus far? How much more, that's much more time does she need to finalize all? And I hope I have more time, but um, also uh, some of the justice workers pertaining to the 50% that was received, sorry to go back to that, but pertaining to that, did every justice worker in every division receive that 50% back then in 2020, 2020, 2020, when was it, 2019, that, that time, that every, everyone received that 50%, like everyone, or, or was some area, some, some, some uh, divisions um, not um, mis, mis or overlooked? And I have one more question, based on what law, maybe I missed it through you, Mr. Chairman, but based on what law is Mr. Dahl, or what article is Mr. Dahl allowed to sign these placements letter? letter? I don't know if it, maybe you mentioned it, maybe is, that, is it that document, that you're, based on that, okay. And um, I think that's it for me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Grisha Harlegar martin Minister of Justice, you have one minute to answer each question under Article 69D, Paragraph 4 of the Rules of Order. I believe there were four questions, so you have four minutes. Okay, um, Minister, you have the floor. Oh, sorry. Placement letter. It's a template that's made where the information is standard. Person's name would be changed, your scale would be changed, your salary would be changed. Maybe the officers are looking at the fact that the, the signature looks digitalized. As Minister of Justice, I came into the organization where our immigration system was not digitalized. So I would sit every Friday signing hundreds of these permits. It gets tiring. So you would then structure yourself digitally that the signature is digitalized. Maybe that's why it is seen as, right? But here's where it gets even better. The opportunity that we are inviting officers in to see the breakdown of their salaries, what they're entitled to, that's where you get personalized. That's where you get individualized and they will be able to see their own situation. Okay, I hope I answered that. Um, citing articles from the Rexpositi. The, 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 the interesting thing about the mention that um, the Rexpositi is not approved yet, but there's a Rexpositi that exists and it's the Rexpositi CAP ASM. It exists. What we're doing is updating. Um, how much time is needed? And that, that is a ticklish thing. Even at the, the um, what is that, town hall meeting, I indicated that I didn't feel comfortable trying to give a date again. And there was at least one officer in the group that said, Minister, whilst I understand you don't want to give a date, for a peace of mind, tell us, okay? And we really did not leave room for disappointment in the sense of the hiccups that we're finding in being able to retrieve the information. So once again, it, it's a case that is difficult for us to be able to state. However, even with our legal, my legal here, discussions are being had to see if there is any legal opportunity to be able to um, you know, uh, take some steps that could help the situation because we do understand the outcry of the officers uh, when we speak about money or financing, etc. We understand that. And I have been asking that all the time. And the only thing is I've been advised that because of the advancement done in 2020, there was no legal basis to move forward with that. But guess what? We have calculations now. We know actuals now. So are we going to use that to our advantage to explore what's possible with my legal? Yes. Okay. Um, 50%, every, did everyone receive? No, everyone would not have received because not everyone is entitled to it within the ministry. So uh, when it comes to CAPSM, certain persons within Lancashire, uh, national detectives, and then some of them from mobile and border of immigration did receive because those are the ones entitled to, okay? And yes, 
But what, what I would say is this, if there's anybody who uh, believes that they should um, and they have proper and, and substantial information to support it, bring it forward. Yeah? Okay. Uh, and that was it? Yeah. That was one more. Oh, Mr. Dahl, the consultant. So again, um, making reference to the Lance Bacillerite, uh, this is what gives the legal basis as a consultant to be able to function in that capacity. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Minister Richardson. Does any members of parliament have any questions for the minister regarding this topic? Yep. Maximum one minute about the same topic under Article 69D, Paragraph 5 of the Rules of Order. And I see MP Christopher Emmanuel is asking the floor, or rather the podium. I would ask MP Emmanuel, you have the podium. I'll take the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to you, Mr. Chairman, the Honorable Minister, support staff. And everyone, justice workers in the Tribune and my honorable colleagues, good afternoon. Minister, let me get right into it. Minister, I've spoken to about 15 individuals in the justice field, and based on their assessment, on the letters that they have received, out of the 15, only two said that they agree with what they have received. So my question to you is, how does that make you feel, seeing that majority of them is not in agreement with the letters that they have received? And in addition to that, I've sat here and heard you make mention of a, a offer letter, and then you said a placement letter. Which one is it really? Is it a offer letter, placement letter, or a proposal letter? Which one is it really that is being offered to the workers that they can hold on to? The offer letter, the proposal, or a placement letter? Which one is it really? In addition to that, let me get into the other questions. Minister, can the minister outline the arrangement made with the consultant, Mr. Dahl? Under what conditions is he working? And for how long is that contract or contracted for? And how does this cost fit into the country? Can, it's one minute already? So it is. And B. Manuel, was that the last question you wanted? Or, okay. Thank you, MP Manuel. Uh, Minister, I would give you the floor to answer with one minute for each question. Sure. Minister, uh, you have the floor. Sure. Sure, thank you. So, MP Manuel, one of the things that I've identified, um, we have seen as well, is that uh, many officers or, or personnel, I should say, are confusing this placement process. The placement process is not a promotion process. And a lot of persons are not happy with the letter they've received or because it doesn't give them the understanding that they are being promoted into a higher uh, position. The placement process is in connection with now the Ministry of Justice has a function book. Where do you place in the function book in terms of the job title, job description, salary scale, etc.? That is where I believe the confusion comes from, or the disappointment. Let me use that word as opposed to confusion. Um, and so we have officers that are, but it's just a conversation. It is a conversation that could be held with your operations head, and in this case, if you're speaking of police officers, they can have a conversation with the chief of police to understand why the decision was made on that level to offer them the position that they've received. Um, offer placement, so the words are interchangeable. They all mean the same in the context of what we're busy with. We're busy with placing people in alignment with the function book. And then under which condition? Mr. Dahl is actually a consultant that is, 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 so it was just a request that I sent to my colleague, Minister in Curacao, to be able to have Mr. Dahl assist us. Only when Mr. Dahl comes, we will cover his per diem for, to be in St. Martin, but we're not paying him a salary or a tulaka or anything of the kind. So there's not really a hefty cost on St. Martin for the assistant Mr. Dahl is giving us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. I now see MP Akeem Arendel. MP Akeem Arendel, you have the podium. You have the floor. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Minister. Good afternoon, Chairman. Good afternoon, everybody in the police force, so, yeah, my fellow colleagues. Um, I will get straight to it. 
as you can see, you have a lot of miscommunication. We in here having misdirection, everybody having misleads about different things. I would want to hopefully um, answer this. What about the department heads? Are they informing the, the workers anything? Talking to them individually? When I was a police officer, I remember we have a jump up coming up. They're spending 15 minutes coming and talking about did I book? What's 15 minutes to come talk to the people and explain them what's going on? So I don't know if you, you're informing the department heads to talk to the individuals. And also, Minister, um, are you willing for yourself to also to talk to every individual for yourself? It's, stop having this much communication. Everybody don't, like this one say, he say. If you would take a one-on-one -on, -one on your time, starting from next week or wherever, so you sit down every afternoon, let's talk to 700 plus, every one of them, so everybody can have an understanding. Instead of going through the union, this one, everybody have their own understanding for itself. Thank you, MP Akeem Arendel. Minister of Justice, you have the floor. Um, definitely, the department heads must be directly involved in this because that's where it begins. Earlier in my, in my statements, I indicated this does not begin with the minister because the minister is not a part of the operations. It begins with the department heads. Now, do the department heads engage with the staff walking around, asking them, hey, how do you feel about your letter? I don't know. Is it a case that the staff themselves are approaching the department heads or only, are they only basing it on whatever the unions are saying to them? I don't know what that's happening, what's happening there. But to roll right into your next question, my door has always been open. It is just the willingness of the officers to come to me one-on-one. -on -one. And this is something that is personalized. You have to be willing to come so that we can speak one-on-one, -on -one, or it's a case that if you are coming as an individual, you're giving the opportunity for my person along with the head of HR, in this case our acting SG, who is also, according to the Lance slide, a member of the placement committee, to meet with you. Hear your grievances. I have never been a closed door. It's always a welcome. But it it is the choice as to whether you're doing this as an individual or you're doing this uh, um, in a unionized form. So my door is open. I am willing to meet with. I can meet with you after this meeting, if you'd like, on an individual basis. Thank you, Minister, for your response. And I now see MP Rolando Bryson. MP Bryson, you have the floor. Mr. Chairman, thank you and good afternoon to one and all. Mr. Chairman, I tend to want to be a very solution-oriented person while appreciating the answers and the questions posed. Um, I have a question that I would like the minister to consider and give a response of this being possible. As we know, um, we were able in 2020 to make payments in terms of, a, let's call that installment, one for lack of a better term. Since then, from what I understand, you have now made calculations that the government believes although many of them may feel that is not accurate, but the government is doing something that I legally consider acknowledging a debt. That's now on paper. So taking that context in the accountability ordinance, there's an acknowledgement of debt to the justice workers. Is it now possible with that calculation to be able to pay the officers based on that debt with the strict condition placed on the government, however, that even if they receive those funds immediately, that they have full rights to still object and say, no, I think I was actually owed more or a different amount, that that right is not taken away from them, where they can receive at least the funds that you believe they are owed, and if there's a difference, that they will then be able to get a chance to appeal it still. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Bryson. Minister of Justice, you have the floor. Thank you, MP Bryson. So as I've mentioned before, um, throughout this whole process, I have been querying and asking if there's opportunities for the legal basis. One thing that MP Bryson did say a few minutes ago is the fact that we can now identify specifically what amount is owed to each person. And indeed, uh, in discussion with my legal, I will try to see, or we will try to see what opportunity, if any, is there to be able to move into another payment um, while we are still busy with calculations, et cetera. Because ultimately, what the governor needs to be able to sign the Lance, um, the El Bayham, um, for the Rex Posizzi, as well as the um, salary scales, is to be able to know that total sum. So MP, it's definitely something that I would like to be able to explore, and I can always provide an update thereafter. Thank you, Minister, and I don't see any more members of Parliament for any questions. Thank you, members of Parliament. I would like to thank the Honorable Minister of Justice, Ms. Anna Richardson, and her support staff 
for their participation here today. I wish everyone a safe Easter weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this question hour. I thank you all for your participation, and I hereby close this question hour.